Um, so in normal circumstances, uh, these seminars would have taken place face to face uh, at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And it's something that we really wish <laughs> to uh, do again in the future, hopefully soon. Uh, but nonetheless, we are delighted to be able to welcome you all from a bit all over the world in the webinar today and uh, hopefully for future webinars as well. Uh, today we have a presentation by uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandre Pulido. Uh, on sustainable development discourse uh, in smart specialization strategies in the case of the Portuguese central region. And before introducing, introducing our speaker, I would just like to inform you that this meeting is being recorded, which means that you and your colleagues have the opportunity to follow the meeting at a later stage. Um, and the recording will then be made available on our YouTube channel uh, and shared with you by email. So we would also like to encourage you to use Twitter to share your thoughts on the webinar uh, and just disseminate as much as possible. Uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with the protocol for Zoom meetings by now, so I'm not going to go too in, de in detail on this. Uh, just a reminder to keep your microphone on mute if you are speaking, if you are not speaking, and use the blue hand uh, with the Zoom raise a hand function if you'd like to make an intervention. Um, or feel free to also write uh, in the chat to send questions or comments, uh, since after uh, Alexandra's presentation, we will have a Q&A. Um, so I'll just present our speaker today. Uh, Alexandra Pulido is a full researcher working in the research unit on governance, competitiveness, and public policies of the University of Aveiro. She has a PhD in environment and sustainability sciences and a master's in environmental engineering, both from the Nova University of Lisbon. She recently started a project entitled Power in the Institutional Relations of Environmental Assessment Through the Practitioner's Lens funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Uh, previous, previously, Alexandre developed uh, research related with community-led network for uh, territorial innovation in the center project, which aims to identify the policy tools which best allow for the valorization of territorial resources to promote employment and quality of life in the Portuguese center region. And uh, with this, I give the floor to Alexandre. Uh, I will just stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Liliana, for the introduction, and thank you to the EPRC for the invitation. And also, I would like to thank the audience for the interest in this research, so it's really nice to see a lot of people here. Um, I am really delighted to be uh, in Strathclyde, back in Strathclyde, because I actually did part of my PhD uh, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering with Dr. Elsa Jean, so it's really nice to uh, be back, so it's really nice. So, uh, the research I'm presenting today is... Uh, um, is a collaboration with my colleagues Sara Muren Pires and Carlos Rodrigues and Philippe Tells, and it was done, uh, it was developed during my postdoc pro in Project Center between 2017 and 2019. So, as we know, uh, globally we are facing uh, environmental. Um, social and economic challenges, such as biodiversity loss, natural resources depletion, and social inequity. And in 2015, the international community recognized the need for a paradigm shift to tackle uh, these global challenges. So, and it was through the Agenda 2030 uh, from the United States that they believe these challenges can be tackled. This agenda has five key themes, the people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership, and is further developed into 17 goals, 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets. It's applicable to all UN members, but it can be developed on a country basis. The agenda has been criticized uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I would like to um, point out two reasons, two specific reasons. One is the lack of concrete guidelines for action and that the majority of targets are not well formulated. But nonetheless, um, it is a well-recognized internationally uh, framework for into forward sustainable development. 
At the European level, the EU always showed an ambition towards being a leader in the implementation of the Agenda 2030. And in fact, since the publication of the Brutland report, uh, that the EU claims that the concept of sustainable development is at the core of the EU project. The EU also states that the cohesion policy um, is key in achieving uh, sustainable development and it can help address 15 out of the 17 uh, goals. We, can, we, we must understand that the cohesion policy aims at achieving economic, social and territorial development and it's currently implemented through uh, regional innovation strategies for smart specialization. And smart specialization has a strong focus on economic development and economic growth. But nonetheless, it is acknowledged that there is a potential to enhance the sustainable development at the subnational level, uh, regional level. So there is a lot of, um, of research done uh, tackling both the structural funds or cohesion policy and sustainable development issues. But with this research, we wanted to look uh, specifically to the degree of embeddedness of the sustainable development discourse in regional development strategies. And we used the central region, the Portuguese central region, as a case study. So the central region is located in the Portuguese main mainland and has um, approximately 31% of the Portuguese total area. It has 2.2 uh, million residents, uh, which is roughly 22% of the Portuguese population. So the region has a, a, a coastal inland dichotomy and a multipolar urban system and a lot of natural resources such as water and forests. We also uh, need to uh, know that one quarter of this population lives in rural areas and also one quarter of the population has over 65 years old, well, so quite aging population. The smart specialization strategy of the central region was start being, uh, started at the end of 2012 and it was an iterative process uh, and it was monitored and assessed to, and adjusted with the, the results. So the, the priorities and action lines suffered some, some, um, some adjustments throughout the time. Overall, it has four main priorities, the sustainable industrial solutions, enhancement of natural endogenous resources, technologies for quality of life and territorial innovation, which are further developed into sub priorities and then action lines. It was mainly implemented through uh, priority one, the sustainable industrial solutions. And these are, this is, data from 2017, but I went to look to, for the new data and the, the landscape is the same. It's still implemented through priority one and now it's at 73%. Uh, so how did we develop this uh, research? What have we done with this research? So it's mainly um, a qualitative research. Uh, we did a content analysis overall to the action lines, the 59 action lines of the smart specialization strategy for the uh, central region. We, we did two uh, coding levels and we used the Agenda 2030 as the overall framework for the coding of the action lines to understand the embeddedness of sustainable development discourse in this uh, smart specialization strategy. So in the first level coding, we used as a coding framework, the SDGs overall aims. So, and we asked the question specifically, is the action line related to an SDG taking into account overall, uh, the overall aim of the SDG and this specific keyword? So we use this question to code one action line with SDGs with the overall aim. 
In the second level coding, uh, we use the coding framework as a coding framework, the SDG specific targets. And we ask the question, could this action line help enhance a specific SDG target? So, and if it answered yes, we would code it uh, at, with the SDG target. And then we use the computer assisted qualitative data analysis software to, to code. And then we retrieve the frequencies of the coding. And afterwards, uh, we try to cluster it into in through the three pillar paradigm of the with the SDGs. So, and we use three different uh, frameworks to to cluster the SDGs into this three pillar paradigm because there are some mismatch between uh, the frameworks. But we will uh, see it uh, in the results section, and we will um, go through it in more detail. So overall, uh, we had um, a matrix, as you see here. We had the, the action lines, which could be coded in the first level coded with the SDG overall aim, so the SDG. And then in the second level coding with the target. So we ended up with this, this matrix. The figure we can see here are, is related with the number uh, of action lines that were coded at least once against the Sustainable Development Goals in the first and in the second uh, level coding. We can see here that the priority one, Sustainable Industrial Solutions, have a total action lines of eight. And in the first level coding, we could uh, code seven action lines with at least one SDG. When we uh, go to the second, uh, when we went to the second level, it was more difficult to code. And we ended up with only four uh, action lines coded with at least one target. In the second priority, the enhancement of natural endogenous resources, we had a total of 21 action lines and we could um, code 17 uh, action lines with the SDGs. And in the second level, we were able to code only 11 action lines with the targets. In priority three, the technologies for quality of life, we can see that we had a total of 10 action lines that we could all um, could code it all with the SDGs overall aim in the first level coding. But in the second level coding, we could only um, code one action line. Regarding the Last priority, uh, priority four, territorial innovation. We have a total of 20 action lines and we could code 13 uh, action lines in the first level and 10 in the second level coding. Uh, this figure shows the coding results uh, um, by the 17 SDGs. We have the SDGs here below and we can see that only one SDG did not was not coded the SDG 17 but the others have, are more or less represented and the most represented is actually SDG 3 uh, relates with good health and well-being uh, and the the others are SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, and the, the two SDGs related with the uh, um, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. We can see that the priority two has a lot of, um, of coding. The action lines of priority two were, uh, have a lot of codings mainly in these um, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And it's also um, regarding natural endogenous resources. So it makes a lot of sense. And also it's, it's coded in the clean water and sanitation the uh, affordable and clean energy and SDG2, which is zero hunger, but it's uh, related with food systems and sustainable agriculture. So um, it was expected this kind of, of um, results. 
in uh, the uh, priority uh, three technologies of quality of life, we can see that was mainly um, coded with SDG3, which is related and it also makes sense, which is related with the uh, health and well-being. So going now to the second, uh, now to the three uh, pillar paradigm, as we can see, and what I was saying before is that uh, the frameworks for the, that combine that uh, combine the three pillar paradigm with the SDGs uh, often may, may uh, put the SDGs in different pillars. So as we can see here, SDG 12 in the UNDP P uh, framework is placed under the environmental pillar, but in here in Rockstrom and Sudkev, uh, it's actually placed under the economy pillar. Um, and back again in Cabasso et al. is also placed under the environmental pillar as in the UNDP. But interestingly, um, the 11, the SDG 11 is placed under economy uh, in the first um, framework, in the second is placed under the social pillar, and in the third framework is placed under the environment. So it was uh, interesting to see also these kind of variations. Overall, in this figure, we can see that uh, we could tackle uh, all of the pillars with this coding the first level coding, we can see there's a good distribution um, among the pillars. When we go to the second level coding, um, we can see that there's a lot less uh, coded action uh, lines and there are uh, some SDGs that disappear entirely. The SDG 17, uh, does not have any coding, but it didn't have also in the first level coding. But for instance, the SDG3 was the most coded in the first level, and now it does not have one single code in the second level. It also disappeared the SDG1, and uh, which is related with no poverty, so a social, a more social uh, SDG, and also SDG five uh, regarding gender equality, also a social, um, a social SDG. We can see that priority two continues to be highly represented in the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, which is quite expected. But the second most coded uh, SDG is SDG 8, uh, which is uh, decent work and economic growth, so an economic SDG. When we cluster it into the three pillar paradigm, we can see and we are only talking about the most represented SDGs. We can see that there is a lack of um, coding in the social uh, pillar, as we could uh, see also in the previous figure when I pointed out that uh, the SDG 1 and 5 were also lacking coding. So there is um, here a lack of um, the social pillar in smart specialization uh, strategy. So despite the results showing there is a good embeddedness uh, of the central smart specialization strategy with the SDGs overall aims, and this is in line with the EU policies, the analysis done to the targets shows a lower integration. These results may be explained by the fact that the central smart specialization strategy started being developed uh, in 2012, which is before the Agenda 2030 was set in place. And even though it is claimed that the Central Smart Specialization Strategy is an iterative process adjusted through time, it can also be suggested that to successfully integrate the SDGs and targets in its, um, it is necessary that the institutions embed this sustainable development discourse in their missions and particularly since the beginning of the strategy formulation. So it's something that we need to think about since the beginning. 
It also may reflect a lack of uh, information at the regional level to understand how the SDGs could be integrated or that the SDGs are not suited for this kind of context or not well formulated as some uh, criticize, some scholars criticize. Interestingly, the central uh, smart specialization strategy action lines are more aligned with the economic and environmental uh, goals than with the social ones, as we've seen in the results. Uh, and we expected a greater prominence of the social issues due to the characteristics of rural landscape and aging population in the central region. These results are actually twofold. Uh, on one hand, the EU has been enforcing for many years uh, environmental policies and economic instruments to support the integration of environmental issues into sectoral policies. But on the other hand, the cohesion policy mainly addresses regional economic development, which gives no surprise to the economic emphasis um, that we encountered in the smart specialization strategy of the central region. Uh, it's also noted a mismatch between the most coded uh, goals in the central strategy and the ones priorities and prioritized at the national level. One explanation for this is that the uh, smart specialization strategy was developed before the definition of these national priorities and, and these results may indicate that the importance of developing regional innovation policies towards sustainable development from the region to the national level. Um, as part of this uh, paper, this research, we also gave three main recommendations for policy. Um, the first recommendation uh, is that we believe it is necessary to develop uh, regional innovation systems that enhance uh, sustainable development to um, understand what are the needs of the Agenda 2030 uh, at the regional level. So, and the assessment of these challenges and the needs could be possible through the development of an ex-ante evaluation. So assess the needs of the regional level through SDGs, through the Agenda 2030. Our, uh, our um, second recommendation is to that the region should put in place a monitoring and evaluation of the system, of the projects financed under a smart specialization strategy, having uh, the Agenda 2030 uh, in perspective uh, and intertwining the, the, the first two recommendations and with the information retrieved from a possible ex-ante assessment and monetization of the implementation of the smart specialization strategy, it would be possible to rethink um, the action lines and priorities seeking the enhancement of the bottom-up process through the identification of stakeholders that are underrepresented in the governance structure. So to conclude, um, one of the most significant findings to emerge from this study is that the central uh, strategy needs to be revisited if it aims to help address SDGs specific targets. A second finding shows that the social issues are uh, disregarded in, in this strategy, despite the aim of the cohesion policy emphasizing the social development. A third finding regards the fact that the implementation of the smart specialization uh, strategy in the central region is mainly being done through uh, projects financed under the economy pillar. And the fourth important finding reinforces the need to develop uh, regional innovation uh, policies towards the SDGs uh, with an alignment uh, from the regional to the national level. 
for future re research, we believe it's important to uh, look deeper into design process of the central uh, smart specialization strategy through interviews and uh, to the actors involved to understand how the bottom-up process was developed because we believe this is a focus issue, uh, the bottom-up process, which is already done in the smart specialization strategies, but it needs to be reinforced with actors that are not usually represented in these, um, in these processes. Also, uh, it would be really interesting to have similar studies for other regions in the EU, so we could compare the results um, and also to conform to conflict with these uh, results. Uh, since the study was limited to the central region, we cannot generalize to other EU regions, but it is critical to debate uh, the role of smart specialization strategies if they aim to act as an effective engine for reducing disparities uh, while framed by uh, SDGs. Uh, in as sustainable development discourses. Uh, finally, we believe it would be really important to examine uh, the type of projects financed under the, the structural funds and to, through cohesion policy and smart specialization uh, strategies and analyze if this uh, may help enhance uh, Agenda 2030 in practice. <clears throat> So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I, I'm really hoping for your questions and for the great discussion. Thank you, Alessandra, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I don't know if anyone already has a question, but I will just <laughs> maybe start it off. <laughs> uh, because um, as I mentioned to you before, we do have a project within EPRC that kind of also aims at uh, considering the sustainable development discourse and sustainable development goals in developing uh, or helping develop research and innovation strategies in uh, regions that are in coal transition. So this includes regions in Wales and Poland and Greece, so a bit all over Europe. Um, and we wondered if you have um, any particular advice in like considering then the design of those, of those smart specialization strategies when considering those goals. So, yeah, so thank you, Liliana, for that uh, question. Um, I really, one of the things that I, I really believe it's important to, to do is to, um, to uh, ask more, a more diverse uh, type of stakeholders into these processes. Sometimes we ended up, we end up with only uh, organizations in civil society or academia or, um, local governments, so, but probably we need to go to the communities in, in itself and to the individuals. This poses some questions, of course, because uh, sometimes um, the individuals may not be, uh, may not understand what are these processes about. So we need to do a, a greater work uh, to, to enhance the, these individuals into understanding the process and how they can deeply uh, contribute to these strategies. So I believe this is fundamental for the, 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 the strategies. I, I believe that you are already doing some, some kind of these efforts in bringing um, together different stakeholders for your project. But yes, yeah, so, but uh, really think about the underrepresented groups and think about also if there are uh, there are a, a almost an, equal, uh, an even gender balance. Also, making taking into account the different ages, so the plurality of voices in these processes, and of course to understand really well what the uh, SDG for clean energy is about. And I believe you already done this and. But put it in a greater, in a greater landscape of the overall S agenda, and what is hoped to achieve with this agenda. So it's not just one single SDG, but the overall the landscape of the agenda 2030. So hopefully, 
I shed some light. Um, yeah, that really <laughs> helps because, as you said, sometimes a specific pillar also may uh, be viewed through different lenses. So we're not just talking about energy, we're talking about the impact that it has also on the communities. So yeah, it's very important. I'm just going to actually um, put a link for the project uh, on the chat. So if anyone's also interested, so this is an H2020 tracer project. And yeah, we really appreciate you. uh, your insight on this. Uh, I see that Andreas Faludi also has a question and feel free to unmute and ask it. Good, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alexandra. Um, as I see it, you set this up as a, an evaluation study, and I'm not a particular uh, expert on evaluation studies, but uh, um, it could be a model for uh, evaluation studies throughout the EU, similar projects. I think a lot depends on the coding process. And, you know, um, I, I didn't get any feeling, any sense of how you have systematized and controlled this coding process and whether that coding process uh, would really lend itself to be repeated throughout the EU. So that's one question. The other one, um, and, and this has nothing to do with ev evaluation now, but you recommend that a more bottom-up approach. Right? And uh, that sounds good and uh, a lot of sympathy for that. But in the area of sustainable development, uh, not, uh, isn't there some strong leadership required? Some, some, uh, the imposition of certain practices and certain goals from the top. Uh, so. isn't, isn't that one of the issues? I mean, if you leave this to bottom-up initiatives, it's the, uh, the guarantee that sustainable goals and development goals will actually be implemented. Uh, so that's that's a more philosophical question, but the first one is a more <laughs> methodological one, which is unlike myself, I'm not a, a great methodologist. Yeah. Good, thank you. Thank you for your uh, for your quite good questions and thought-provoking one. Um, so regarding the um, the coding process, uh, yes, it can be uh, can be difficult to replicate, but. What we did was uh, I, uh, we did iteratively coded three times the action lines and we discussed it among it, all the authors. How could this be replicated in other, in other regions and to a more robust uh, framework? It's just to repeat the process often because content analysis is, is really about it. It's about the, a good coding process. If you do it iteratively um, and do it f uh, f with many coders, with many people coding, you can, uh, in the end, have a robust framework. So you need a team to do this. The content analysis cannot be done by only one person. So it goes through there. A lot of people coding it so we can have a robust framework. Uh, and it can be replicated in other in other regions too, with this having this in mind, and probably validating through workshops with others, um, with other stakeholders, not only academics or, or or people that are interested in looking at this from the methodological point of view. So so just doing a lot of coding process and then cross uh, analysis all these frameworks that are delivered for by each coder. Regarding the bottom-up process in sustainability, it, it really depends, it is a philosophical, almost a philosophical question because it really depends um, on your way uh, of thinking about sustainability. There are, there are uh, some theorists that uh, say it should be uh, top bottom, but the, 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 the ones that I, I find most interesting, uh, it's the ones that say the sustainability, sustainability is for whom, right? So if it's for the, for the citizens and for the societies, uh, probably we should hear the, the individuals in these societies, we should hear the communities in these societies. So, and with that said, that's why I believe it is important to have a bottom-up process and not only a, a top-down uh, process in sustainability processes. Uh, 
it has a lot to do with policies, of course. Uh, and uh, I don't agree with the, the academics that say that also the individuals are the main part of it. No, it's um, a broader issue and it needs to all be connected, both policies and individuals and uh, um, to, so that's why I believe it's important to have these bottom-up processes with a robust um, uh, framework, with a robust, um, well, with a lot of diversity of individuals. So they can also think that sustainability is something that is theirs also to do. So some accountability too. If they are involved in these processes, the things are easier to transform into transition. So it's, thank you for the question. It's really tough to answer this question, but um, yeah, but it's more or less. I, I think, uh, I hope I made, I shed some light on the, the question. Uh, so I see that also Victoria has a question. I don't know if you want to uh, also unmute and go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandra. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, wonderful. Also very interesting article. Uh, maybe just uh, to add to the actually the point that uh, Andreas Faludi did regarding the, um, the bottom-up approach. I uh, just also had uh, some thoughts on that. Um, uh, have you... Um, have you um, had a chance to have a look at whether this sort of mismatch that you mentioned in terms of uh, mismatch uh, um, regarding SDG aims and SDG targets that exist at the regional level um, also exist at the national uh, level in terms of uh, national level uh, smart specialization strategy? Because uh, do you have any thoughts on it? Or any information regarding that if uh, there is also this mismatch? No, actually, I don't have many more information of what I've said before. The, the, uh, the strategy was done before the, the SDGs and the national level, uh, there was not um, a process of trickling down the, uh, the, the priorities of the national level to this, the regions yet. I believe it's, the regions are now making that effort to do their own uh, 2030 strategies and to understand what are the most important SDGs for, for their region. But by the time we did this, um, this research, this work was not yet done. And I'm not sure if there is really, um, well, at the national level, if they don't talk with the regional level, of, it's just a misfortune. I did not add uh, the opportunity to study this issue specifically. Okay, yeah, thank you. But I was just thinking, for example, if hypothetically we imagine that, as you said, first the regional uh, strategy, the smart specialization strategy was developed, as was also the case in some other Portuguese regions, uh, which was the first step, and then sort of national smart specialization strategy served as kind of umbrella strategy, then uh, collecting all these different uh, priorities and aims and targets. So I suppose maybe we can expect some kind of also even greater degree of mismatch between those, between aims, sustainable development aims uh, and targets on the other hand. And so so uh, as you're proposing, uh, the priority would be to go for bottom-up approach, where first we start with regional strategies and then come to the national one, but also echoing what Andrea said, uh, maybe for certain specific, for certain uh, smart uh, sustainable development goals, such as climate action, for example, there's really a need for a very strong national uh, framework to help achieve uh, specific targets, for instance, very strong national legislation, some matters, for example, regarding climate mitigation, where even if... Uh, targets uh, and aims at regional level perfectly aligned and make sense it would be pretty much impossible probably to achieve a national level without a strong national support framework also financial resources uh, where in the Portuguese case where the regions really lack those to implement uh, their priorities so I was wondering whether it makes sense to continue developing uh, these dimensions regional and national in parallel so that there, that there is alignment and that actually there is uh, insurance that the priorities at the regional level can, can be implemented in terms of SDGs. Yeah, thank you, Vittoria. Um, so I'm, uh, I believe uh, what, I, what I'm talking about here is really the, if the smart specialization um, takes into account the SDGs, I'm not thinking 
I'm not thinking of the if the the SDGs are met per se, okay, globally. I'm I'm thinking about how can uh, as, as uh, this strategy help um, help achieve the the SDGs. Um, and I'm talking about the process of smart specialization in itself. And this process of the smart specialization, specialization I believe we need to do with the, the through a, a strong bottom-up process. With that said, that doesn't mean that, of course, and you said it well, that we need um, central uh, from the government policies and financial resources to achieve the sustainable development goals but the how are we going to achieve also the sustainable development goals and this is way off my presentation but it can be also through the integration of this kind of mindset the agenda 2030 mindset into the different policies Okay, so this is what we have done in the European Union, integrating environmental uh, conservation and management issues into different sectoral policies. And this, uh, and what I'm, I'm trying to, to advocate a bit here is that we also need to do the same for the sustainable development goals. And we need to have strategies that are mostly about economic growth and economic development and change them to have a different mindset and having different goals and starting thinking about, uh, okay, we need a smart specialization strategy to develop a territory, but what kind of development do we want? And I believe we, we need to, we, we, we need to want what the, the communities and um, the people living in that region want, but having as, um, as a background this wider sustainable development societies uh, and sustainable futures. And uh, so, and this may mean a transition to uh, renewable uh, energies or other things. Okay, so what I, what I, what I think is that it's not just the academics and the um, the technicians in in the in the the regional level organizations that need to decide. We need to put also uh, other stakeholders in this uh, discussion. That's that's mainly the need. But I, I I agree with you, Victoria. I agree with you that we also need top down approaches. So we need the protest from everywhere, <laughs> mainly, basically. <laughs> um, we already have two more questions, one from Monica and one from uh, Katerina. So uh, Monica, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, very sorry for lack of camera, but I'm in Seville where we have uh, very big storms now and the uh, internet is uh, uh, super poor. Um, I have, I think, three um, small questions and, and maybe some comments. Um, I just introduced myself. I, I'm at the moment not from academia. I work in the European Commission and GRC Seville, where I coordinate uh, the, work, the new work stream uh, um, on smart specialization for sustainable development goals. Um, so um, in terms of questions I would like to ask, um, um, first one would be, uh, has the analysis that you presented, and first of all, thank you very much for taking up this topic in a more academic way, because we took it up purely on practical reasons. Uh, um, uh, has this work been consulted or done uh, in some kind of dialogue with regional authorities of central region, uh, or uh, this is uh, um, going on outside? Um, I'm asking this question specifically because we are in the process of collecting, we call them inspirations from different territorial levels in the EU and not only in the EU, um, on volunt voluntary um, declarations from authorities on how the smart specialization strategy is contribute to sustainable development goals. Because as you mentioned yourself, obviously this process uh, or this has not been a requirement for those strategies when they were being designed. Uh, so uh, that would be interesting case for us uh, that, that um, if central uh, authorities also uh, consider their smart specialization contributing to SDGs. Um, my second question would be why 
um, have you chosen to analyze action lines and not priority domains for smart specialization? Because this was, we did some um, uh, internal uh, practical analysis use, uh, based on the database that we manage uh, of priority domains from, uh, from the EU, from smart specialization strategies. And this was kind of natural decision that we took, not focusing on action lines or strategy objectives, but more on the, on the domains. And my last question would be, um, have you considered the issue of interlinkages and trade-offs between SDGs? Because in the SDG discourse, this is a big topic that's under consideration that uh, the pure fact of um, contributing to the achievement of SD on one SDG is in a way not good enough because uh, a progress on this one SDG can um, cause some negative uh, effects on, um, on uh, other SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, maybe I stop here and then I, I have one or two comments just uh, uh, to let you know uh, the kind of discussion uh, we are into, but maybe i let you answer first. Well, thank you, Monica, um, for the interesting questions. I, I also uh, saw some, um, some presentations by the JRC uh, and uh, I think it was also one of yours in the Smarter 2020 conference about the STI for SDGs and other, other instruments that you are developing. So really interesting. Um, we, this, this, this uh, research was done under a project center and project center was uh, connected with the uh, commission for development for the regional development. And we had the opportunity to present the results to the commission, which is currently doing the uh, smart specialization strategy for the next uh, framework of um, finding. Um, and they already starting to um, thinking about the smart specialization strategy, uh, having uh, the agenda 2030 and the Green Deal uh, on the background. So um, they are thinking about implement and we, we, we discussed this and they are thinking about implementing the monitorization system uh, through um, the SDGs. To, with uh, the one the recommendation that I uh, that we did about mon monitoring the um, the project's finance under the smart specialization with the SDG so they are they are thinking about putting this in practice and they are also uh, thinking about the agenda 2030 while doing the action lines for the uh, next smart specialization strategy. Regarding why the action lines and not the priority domains, because the, the action lines were a bit more uh, uh, fine-grained analysis. So the priority domains are good intentions, but then they are um, put in, in practice by the action lines. And that's what interested us. Uh, and this is what is going to um, help fund projects or not under the smart specialization strategy. So this is what we believe it would be important to study, to have a more uh, fine grained analysis of the, the strategy. Um, because priority domains are umbrella terms, right? So if I'm understanding correctly, if we are talking about the, the same things. Uh, and uh, if I consider the interlinkages and trade-offs between SDGs, we did not. We, we looked at it as single uh, SDGs. And, but this takes us to the, uh, also the criticism that SDGs also um, take uh, on the, the academia. So academia and others and others. Uh, so the SDGs are in the agenda 2030 is heavily criticized for different reasons. And that is one of them. So probably the SDGs need to be uh, fine tuned, right? The, the targets and uh, need to be fine tuned and improved uh, because there are some uh, issues that are, are not well, um, well thought of when done. So yeah, we did not consider the interlinkages. We will look at it in individual way. Thank you very much uh, uh, for these answers. Uh, uh, just, uh, and maybe just like a few comments, maybe to also 
give food for thought for any future research uh, Thank you. Uh, and things kind of issues that we are considering uh, also yeah. in terms of policy guidelines. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to mention uh, like we really uh, uh, are very impressed and happy that uh, many, many regions and also countries or sometimes uh, local level authorities take up SDGs uh, and actively want to adjust the smart specialization strategies to that. But we have to be uh, aware that it is uh, for the past programming period, it's completely voluntary exercise. Obviously, it's not part of the regulation, part of requirement. And also, like, honestly, not part of the definition of smart specialization, original smart specialization um, a strategy as knowledge based economic um, transformation agenda. Uh, we are now considered the work we are doing at the moment. This is this consideration that based on Addis Ababa action agenda um, for the implementation of, uh, of Global Agenda 2030, that science, technology, and innovation should be considered as a means to, to, for the achievement of basically all the SDGs. And in this context, we are looking at smart specialization as research and innovation strategies to also consider them. But we also have to be aware that even in the regulation uh, for the new period, it is not uh, foreseen as obligatory requirements. So it's still, we are keeping this, uh, this, vo this voluntary access, but issues we are considering, uh, for example, I think one colleague mentioned that in the questions before the, the relation between top down and bottom up, uh, this is actually a very big discourse in reinventing smart specialization in a way, because um, the essence of smart specialization is bottom up and global agenda is top down. And uh, this is the issue and narrative of directionality in the policy making that I honestly say we don't have an answer for yet, but it's something that really has to be considered. And uh, probably uh, the direction of thinking should be via localization of SDGs. Yeah? But this is uh, some very um, initial um, thought, put for thought. Uh, in practical policy making terms, it's also worth mentioning. Uh, you mentioned the Portuguese national level priorities. I understand that they come from a na uh, voluntary na uh, national review. Exactly. Uh, in practical policy making terms, uh, this is even a different ministry. Even if we're talking national small specialization, <laughs> voluntary national review, this is policy uh, ministry of uh, foreign uh, affairs usually. And uh, um, for smart specialization could be economy, innovation, regional development, and so on. So this is a big issue and I don't think at the moment like legally there is anybody that's only based on goodwill really uh, so this is one kind of issue to be considered for the future how uh, like what what even best advice we could give on that uh, that is implementable um, the second issue is I, and I think you touched on it um, the uh, issue of contributing to SDGs uh, on different uh, stages in policy cycle yeah now we you know obviously because we have new programming period the big focus is on the design or update of the strategies, but there is also the issue of contribution via actual implementation and especially projects. And uh, then uh, via specific uh, monitoring indicators that would be completely uh, completely different. So, uh, so yeah, so this is uh, uh, probably, um, yeah, some bigger questions. And obviously after that, it comes, you know, recommended methodologies, methods we can use uh, that are actually, um, not only academically sound, but also practical for implementation. So, so thank you uh, again for, for sharing your thoughts and uh, allowing me to share mine uh, as well, because this is actually, we really um, treat it very seriously and hope to uh, at least inspire as many authorities um, in the European Union and beyond to do it. Yeah, um, And then maybe in the next programming period to, uh, to make it obligatory. Thank you, Monica. Really interesting. And you also uh, also answered a question that someone that Victoria made me. So thank you for that too. Uh, we still have time for further questions. So Katerina, uh, you have your hand raised, please. <laughs> I, we can't hear you. At least I can't. I uh, don't know. Maybe um, you can type it in the chat as well. Unfortunately, still can't hear you. So I will advise maybe just typing your question in the chat. And um, if anyone else also has a question, uh, we're coming up at one o'clock, but uh, yeah, Victoria, maybe. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it's almost at one. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I've already asked enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, Katarina, maybe, um, I don't know if you're typing, I can't uh, really hear you. Uh, but I will just say now to everyone that has attended, thank you very much <laughs> for your interest in this webinar. Um, and also thank you to Alexandra, Alexandra for um, presenting today. Our next webinar will take place on Wednesday, February 3rd, uh, when EPRC's Martin Ferry will present on the 15-minute city. Uh, so that may be of interest to you as well. Uh, and if you have any further questions to Alexandra, feel free to get in contact with us as well or with her if you already have her email and uh, we can forward that on. Um, as I said, we will post this recording. Um, and yeah, uh, we will post this recording on the YouTube channel and we'll share it with all of you. So uh, if I can't see any further questions since you already put your email <laughs> on the chat, <laughs> yes. um, I will just uh, end this webinar for today. So thank you very much for everyone for attending. I hope you have a good day. Oh.